everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Interview with Scientist. Our guest for today is Dr. Mona Zaveri. She is the founder and executive director of Music Beats Cancer. Music Beats Cancer aims at addressing the growing gap in funding that constrains the translation of cancer research discoveries to clinical application. In the next 30 minutes, we will talk with Mona about cancer research, funding in cancer research, and Music Beats Cancer. Thank you, Mona, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So our first question is uh, about your research background. Can you tell us a little bit about your PhD studies? Yeah. Um, well, so I'm, um, I'm a cancer researcher by training. And many people ask me, um, well, how did you get into cancer? And, uh, you know, what, what inspired you? In fact, um, it didn't, it, it really wasn't that um, sensational, mm -hmm. you know. So when I, um, I went to the university, um, a Wake Forest University, and that's where I, I um, uh, entered my PhD program. Yeah. And when we, I remember this very distinctly, when we were, when we entered, we were all in our 20s and we didn't know what we wanted to do. <laughs> um, you know, we were young. We didn't have people who necessarily passed away from diseases or yes. anything like that. So when we uh, entered our program, we were given three choices. We either focus on AIDS yeah. <laughs> research, cardiovascular or, you know, heart disease or cancer. And, you know, we, we weren't looking at it from the disease perspective. We were looking at it from, well, you know, these labs are nicer yes. over here and okay, it happens to be cancer. So we'll just, you know, we'll just park ourselves and um, where we really want to be with these friends or this investigator is really, really, you know, um, really nice or well known yeah. or we want to work with him or her. So that it, it wasn't actually a choice or a drive in terms of um, the disease. Yes. But once I got into the program and once I started taking classes, I started falling in love with the study of cancer okay. or oncology. And um, it, it fascinated me. And it was one of those things like this was the beginning of molecular biology. Or I should say more accurately, molecular biology existed. But this is when it started to explode, <laughs> okay. when it started to become an industry. Yeah. And so I would say my, my background is that I'm, while I'm a cancer researcher and my PhD is in biochemistry, my deep skills um, are in molecular biology. Okay. That means working with DNA, working with RNA, PCR studies, dicing and splicing and cloning and yes. sequencing and all these things that we were doing way, way back in the 90s that mm -hmm. it's only now that we can talk about them with the public. And I remember, you know, coming back from school, from graduate school and realizing um, I'm learning all these things. I just can't tell anybody about it because <laughs> nobody would understand what an mRNA is. Yes. Um, but can you imagine the world has so radically changed? We are developing mRNA vaccines now. <laughs> exactly. And, and it was and it is a completely, um, you know, to my uh, surprise, pleasant surprise that there is now come a day where we can say mRNA vaccines, where we can yes. say PCR tests, where we can say, you know, uh, and talk about vaccines and, and detection and variants and mutants. And this, the, the world has adopted the, the lingo yes. that where, you know, when way back when, I never thought I would ever see this day. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's amazing, it, the, yes. you know, it's a, the, the fact, you know, we, we call it here in the United States, we, we say, you know, uh, when we, we, we've launched a moonshot on cancer yeah. or, or let, we're, we're going to launch a moonshot because when the war on cancer was declared here in the United States back when then President Nixon mm -hmm. um, signed the National Cancer Act, he called it a moonshot because we had just put a man on the moon. Yes. Um, However, you know, and it was back then, it really was. It was like, well, we just put this man on the moon. This is amazing. We should do something equally amazing in cancer. Yeah. But what I think the public has yet to realize, we've done more than put a, a metaphorical man on the moon when it comes to cancer. <laughs> we've gone to other galaxies. Yes. 
because cancer is just that complex yes um and that much you know and difficult to crack uh so i i think the moonshot moonshot is is too shallow for this for this effort it, it really is more of going into different galaxies and science yes. that we we never uh, could imagine have happened yeah we have evolved since 1969 <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i've learned that you've started a company known as Foligo Therapeutics. So can you tell us what motivated you to start the company? Yeah, so I was, um, I was working uh, at the National Cancer Institute, which is um, outside of Washington, DC, uh -huh. in, in Bethesda, Maryland. And that's what I was doing my postdoc. So you know, after you get your doctorate, the next step is to do what's called a postdoctoral training yes. and to specialize. And in my case, we were specializing in um, in what, what was called, uh, I, I guess we, we call, you know, it's gene regulation, but, mm -hmm. the, but the greater um, sort of area was called drug resistance. Okay. And this was big back then because what was happening in cancer is that chemo, was and still is one of yes. the first line treatments for almost every cancer yeah. and 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 you know when it when we first launched chemos it was an innovation of the mm -hmm. 1950s frankly after world war ii yeah. um but then came this whole problem when we when we treat with chemo inevitably people's cancers would return yes. and when they return they returned with a with a vengeance. They were more malignant, more aggressive, and they were changed tumors. Yes. And as we had the tools of molecular biology, we can now go in and see what had changed at the DNA level. Yes. And so that became a whole field called drug resistance. Yes. And I was part of that era, if you will. Yeah. And so I was in a lab where we were looking at a receptor called the folate receptor mm -hmm. and the folate receptor was thought to be instrumental in in channeling methotrexate which was one of the oldest chemos okay um however it's not really clear that the that just because the folate receptor could bind to methotrexate which is basically what's called an antifolate that it in mm -hmm. fact the uh, you know folate receptors were in fact uh, you, you know part of this mechanism yes. but that's what this lab was studying the folate receptor and it, it we came to a point where we realized if we knocked out the folate receptor in cells yes uh, it would kill cells and uh and we realized that in cancers this receptor was elevated uh -huh. in, in certain cancers and and was not elevated in normal cells. So now we had an approach to create a targeted therapy, okay. which we did, and we would target these receptors with small pieces of DNA. Yeah. And that became the invention. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it was kind of new at the time and nobody, you know, so you, so in order, whenever you invent something, yes. the next thing you do, at least in the United States, is you got to file a patent. Yeah. And of course, if you invent something and you work for an organization, you don't own that invention. You have signed off your rights yes. as an inventor. So it becomes your job to figure out how to get those rights back, whether you license it. And, yeah. um, and, and, in, and in order to really develop the mm -hmm. science, you know, like they say, just because you invent something, that doesn't mean you've innovated anything. Yes. And invention doesn't mean equal an innovation. <laughs> so in order to turn it into a something innovative, you have to traverse out of academia, out yeah. of being a scientist, and become what we call an entrepreneur, or in our field, a biotech entrepreneur. Yes. And in order to do that, you have to spit out a company, you got to hire, you got to have a lab, and you got to continue the work, except the work must be put on a commercial track. Yes. And that's what we what we did. And we have to get the rights to do it. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the National Cancer Institute gave me back my okay. inventorship rights. Okay. And from there, I filed the patents and started a company and we raised money and we pitched and did all the classical things mm -hmm. that an entrepreneur would do, except we got to a point where we realized it wasn't going to be easy to raise money and the kinds of money we needed 
was in the order of millions simply okay. to get it into humans and prove its safety and prove its efficacy. Yeah. And at that point, I realized this is too difficult. And we had to uh, shut the company down. And, and, you know, in a certain way, for good reason, it was difficult. It was because our project was too early. Mm -hmm. It took too much cash. It would take too much time. And any sound investor would say, go and get some money, some other money, and de-risk the project yeah. and develop it. And make it more appealing yes. for an investor. Yes. Um, but the next best question is, well, how do we do that? Where do we get that money? Who's going to support that? There are so few funding sources mm -hmm. to support early stage, cutting edge innovation that inevitably companies like mine and ideas like mine fall through the wayside. wayside. Yeah. And, and we say this in our field, it, it, they've fallen in the valley of death. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you've heard this term, the valley yes. of death. Yep. So as you know, the valley of death isn't a real place. Yes. It's a metaphorical place. It's where the great ideas go to die because they lack the critical funding to move forward. Yes. And this is unfortunate for companies like mine. It's unfortunate for our industry, but yes. worse, it's unfortunate for the public because they never get to benefit yes. from all these great ideas. Yeah. And that's when I realized that the valley of death is a, is a public health crisis. Yeah. And yet the public is unaware. And so I, I launched this charity, Music Beats Cancer, as a way to address this public health crisis okay. that I see it, or to share that in fact, it is a public health crisis and the public must get around innovation yes if we are to win this war on cancer definitely value of death is very common in all fields of research not just cancer so yeah <laughs> so how can we address this funding issue associated with research or specifically with cancer research yeah so our the our model in particular is crowdfunding okay and i don't know if crowdfunding is really an American thing or a world thing. Yes. I'm not sure. It's certainly an American thing. And certainly there are many crowd models out there. And we yes. all know Uber and we all know Airbnb. Um, but there are a lot of um, sites and platforms that yeah. are cause oriented and they beckon the crowd to support, um, whether it be GoFundMe yeah. or um, um. You know, I'm sure you've heard of that yes. one, and I'm sure you've heard of others. Um, Kickstarter, which was one of the first. Yeah. Um, and, and Music Beats Cancer was modeled a bit after Kickstarter, where Kickstarter was same, they have the same issues. Mm -hmm. they, it was built for creatives. Okay. People who had, were mus musicians yes. or made movies, yes. and they couldn't get the classical investors to support them. So they went to the crowd. Okay. And from there, they could rally the crowd because they had fans. Yes. And sure enough, um, Kickstarter, I mean, they've raised billions over the years on their on their site. Yeah. And there have been many movies that got off the ground or yes. albums yes. or widgets or whatever it has <laughs> been that have gotten off the ground because the people, mm -hmm. you know, supported it. And we thought, well, we need to do that except our creators will be innovators, will be scientists and entrepreneurs. Okay. And we will rally the crowd yeah. and get off the ground because mm -hmm. maybe this is how we can address this valley of death. Okay. But we ran into a problem, which is the public doesn't know much about biotech. They yeah. never, I mean, at least when we started, they never even heard the word biotech. They, it was out of their sort of understanding that when it comes to fighting the war on cancer, in their yes. minds, we were looking for the cure. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we were we were supporting research for the cure, yeah. but that's not what was happening. Um, research doesn't end in cures; it ends in ideas, and those ideas must be advanced and commercialized, and that takes time and money and effort. Um, yes, and the public is unaware, so it became our our job to become this interface between innovators who are actively working on solutions for cancer yes. and people who want to see change yes. and progress. Yes. And so that's how our organization sort of 
um, sort of found its path and its niche is we would be this interface. And unlike other charities, Music Beats Cancer was not launched uh, because I lost somebody to cancer or there was this connect. It was launched because we understood that we had a breakdown in our war on cancer. Yes. You know, from a scientist's perspective and from an innovator's perspective. And this made us unique. Mm -hmm. um, and so the music part was, was brought in because we realized if we are going to bring, do this crowd model, if we were going to take this into a public forum, we needed a medium to do that. Yes. And music became our way to reach the masses. Yes. And what was, I guess, brilliant about music is that music we believed had power. It, it sort of traversed ages and eras yes. and genres and countries. And you know, as I'm speaking to you, you're, you're in one place, one country, I'm another country. And we could, we, we can bring the world together but, with music. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and, and that too, um, musicians, I feel, sort of hold also a power to motivate and inspire crowds mm -hmm. and to get them around a new way to fight and finance this war on cancer. Yes. So uh, how is Music Beat Cancer helping the biotech ecosystem and bringing better treatment option for patients so, suffering from cancer? Yeah, I mean, we we are filling this gap or we are addressing this gap, uh -huh. this valley of death issue. Okay. And I believe 90% of biotechs out there, people, you know, organizations with great ideas yeah. are underfunded. Yes. We hear about the ones that, you know, have raised money, but there are many, many, many more mm -hmm. that are traversing this valley of death and they simply need a chance. And so we want to help this community and this industry in this way. Yes. Um, but, but more broadly, we think this is beyond the industry. This is more about um, revolutionizing how we fight this, this war on cancer. Yes. It's not simply about supporting research mm -hmm. or supporting care. Yeah. Innovation is going to be part of it. And we've seen through COVID yes. that had we not had innovation, there would be no mRNA yes. vaccine. There would be no PCR tests. Yes. These are innovations that have, have been around, as I mentioned, for, for decades. Yes. Perhaps they were uh, in, in our platform. We have a lot of companies who come on our platform and they're working on innovations for cancer, uh -huh. but then they pivoted and then they, and they pivoted and used their innovation to to help combat COVID. Yes. And this is what scientists and innovators do. The, the innovation is important. Um, and, and even though innovation may have started in the United States or started in Europe, that doesn't make them unaccess inaccessible to the world. Yes. And you can see many, many countries in the world are, um, are using um, Pfizer's innovation. Yes. Right and and BioNTech's innovation, um, and this is what's amazing is that it, it, while while we may be American focused yes. in terms of growing innovation and scientists and so forth, at the end of the day, the hope, and as we see what's happening in COVID, um, the world will will benefit. Yes, no, that is definitely true. And as we are speaking about COVID, and I read your recent article. With your collab about your collaboration with IES Life Science yes. fundraising COVID nineteen, can you tell us more about it? Yes, I mean that was so super exciting. Um, so IES Life Sciences um, is a company that was on our platform. Yeah. They began working on a technology to detect ovarian cancer, uh -huh. and they have an interesting technology. Again, it's PCR based. It's yes. a um, it's a test, and the idea here is that they are detecting interferons, okay. the launch of interferons. And we all have 20 some odd interferons. Yes. And the and anytime we get sick, yeah. you know, our body launches the first the first mm -hmm. sort of defense uh, of the immune system is are these interferons. In fact, they get launched even before you have symptoms. Yeah. So this makes 
the ability to, to detect them really unique because you can tell whether you have a disease well before you have it. Yes. And the ability to have knowledge um, of something before you actually have symptoms and you, yes, and you become debilitated yeah. is gold, right? Because yeah. now you can do something. Yes. And in the case um, of COVID, they pivoted their technology mm -hmm. and they figured out how to outfit the technology so that we could determine not only if you have COVID, but how severe will this will will your disease be? Yes. Will you be okay, or will this land you in the huh? hospital yeah. on an incubator? You know, on an intubator. Yes. So this again, this this knowledge is me is is, is truly meaningful, um, and and they are developing it, and they are filing for an emergency use authorization. Yes. Um, but an idea like this, which is brilliant and useful, needs funding, of and. Course. This this is something our platform was able to help with, but even beyond our platform, this company needs to raise uh, millions and needs to get bigger investors and dollars around them. And so um, that's our hope is to continue to be instrumental in bringing important funding to great ideas that we think um, are will, will impact the world. Yes. Both in COVID, but in cancer. And as you know, there are way too many cancers uh, that are would have been curable, like ovarian, had yes. they been de detected earlier. Yeah, no, that is... But when they're detected too late, it's basically a, a death sentence for people. And, and this is just hard. This, yes. this is just what, what has become the problem. Yeah, definitely. So uh, can you tell us about some of your current campaigns that you're running on Music Beat Cancer? Yeah, we have a handful of campaigns. Uh, we've got a campaign that is working on a new antibiotic okay. uh, to deal with superbugs. And there have been many predictions that superbugs will be the next pandemic. Um, and that the current antibiotics on the market will not be able to deal with new bacteria that have gained the ability to uh -huh. sort of circumvent the, the current antibiotics. And so, I think there is a role yes. um, for for developing um, new antibiotics for superbugs, and for cancer patients in particular, yeah. when when they are on chemo or after they have had surgery, their their treatment goes hand in hand with antibiotics, and yes. they are very susceptible to um, being um, for, from from having to deal and fight. A superbug infection, yes. uh, you know, and it's bad enough that they have cancer. It's worse if they have an infection yep. and 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 do not um, respond to uh, chemotherapy. Uh, sorry, sorry um, antibiotics. And so, you know, our our uh, our campaigns, while they may not all be working on cancer directly, yes, there is always a role. Um, you know, where we see. Um, um, scientists working on really innovative stuff that could be helpful in, in treatments. Yes. Um, so that's one campaign. We have another campaign working on, um, um, on a new device mm -hmm. to help cleanse blood. We have, a, as, as you may know, um, in, in cancer therapy, there's a lot of um, cancer patients who yes. rely on blood transfusions. Um, and I've had friends who have been in that situation. They've had taken so much chemo mm -hmm. that they've lost the ability to um, generate uh, blood cells. And so they rely on blood transfusions. And so this company has come up with a way yep. to cleanse blood of pathogens. But this is also useful in COVID yes. because there are many people that have used convalescent plasma yes. um, in hopes of combating COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just examples of what's currently on our platform and we've okay. got more to come. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there's no shortage of great ideas, yeah. not only to help cancer, but to help other, other. Um, other diseases. Definitely. So we briefly talked about music beats cancer, but uh, I would like to ask you, is there any relation between music and disorders or music and cancer? And how did you come, with, come up with this name, Music Beats Cancer? Yeah, um, so pe people have asked me that a lot. And I don't, I mean, clearly there are people looking at music and health. Yes. And music as an access to maybe better health. 
that is not necessarily where we f- are focused on. We see music as a medium yes. to reach people. Yes. Um, uh, but but we do acknowledge that there are there are ways that music and sound can be used uh, as as a way to to combat diseases. Yes. Um, but how we came up with the name is really interesting because I am not a musician and I have no leads into the music industry. In fact, it was not natural for me to go and reach musicians. And um, this was sort of something that came, uh, that happened on my journey. And okay. I met people who said, you know, you need to align this with something. And yes. how about music? And yes. in my naivete, I said, yeah, that sounds great. Um, only to realize it's difficult. And I ended up having to knock on a lot of doors yeah. before some opened. And we entered um, a, a sort of a people who could take us into the mm-hmm. music industry and yeah. bring us to musicians. Okay. And um, it's... What was interesting is when I began, people said to me, well, Mona, you need a you need a celebrity to get on board and be the face. Yes. And I and I tried and I said, all right, let, let's see who can do this. Um, but in the end, that, that's not where uh, the, dur- the journey led us. Uh-huh. Um, in the end, we found it, it became easier to reach emerging artists yes. because celebrity artists, while they could bring their fame, um, they were hard to reach, and mm-hmm. if you did reach them, you had to pay pay for them. They may or may not have cared about the issue. Yeah. Um, so we found that going to emerging artists, um, what could be more powerful? Yes. And could could help us also democratize how we you know fund yeah. innovation. And um, so we, we found that there, there were no shortage, there was no shortage of emerging artists all uh-huh. over the world, yeah. all over the planet. Many of them were hungry, they were authentic, they cared, they had a story. Yes. Um, and you, you may or may not have uh, noticed, but we've actually had um, a lot of press around <clears throat> our musicians. Yes. Um, who have shared their story and why they have aligned um, with music beats cancer. Okay, that sounds like a very interesting goal. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, do you have any advice for people who want to join Music Beat Cancer, and how can they participate? Yes, please come to our website, musicbeatscancer.org. dot um, org. If you are an innovator, um, we would be grateful if you could reach out to us. Um, My email is Mona at musicbeatscancer.org. And if you're an artist, please reach out to me as well, Mona at musicbeatscancer.org. We are open to all artists um, who want to align with what we're doing. Um, And certainly when it comes to um, innovation, we do have a a way to vet and we are looking for innovations that we think Really? are worthy and can make a difference um and and so um that that's uh, that's how we are looking at and and um, especially for cancers that are not addressed yes brain cancer pancreatic cancer um even things like there is breast cancer but then there's also facets of breast cancer like triple negative breast cancer yeah we are seeking uh to to bring the world solutions um on our platform. Okay. Um, so are you so, only? Yeah. Op- oh, thank you. Are you only open to U.S. citizens or anyone from the world? Anybody country? on the planet. Okay. We see our our platform as a world platform. Yeah. And we hope in future to bring our platform to world forums. In fact, currently we're 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 ex- um, exploring um, Expo twenty twenty in Dubai, yeah. um, but but that we won't stop there we want to we want to explore other world platforms like the world economic forum or um you know south by southwest um we want to be known as the world charity yes uh, the go-to charity for um, ideas um to fight cancer and we want musicians all over the world not just us to bring their efforts, their energy um, to help fight to help fight 
our war uh, on cancer. Thank you very much, Mona, for your time today and sharing your thoughts and about the wonderful organization that you have started, Music Beats Cancer. I'm sure many people will join you after watching and listening to you and your thoughts. Thank you, Chinmaya. I'm grateful for, for to be on your platform Thank and I'm you. grateful what, for what you have done with Addictive Brain because I think it's brilliant to have a place where scientists can speak and share and engage the greater the greater public yes. all over the world and i'm glad your platform is also global <laughs> yes thank you very much all right take care <laughs>